everybody it is silicon time i said i would do these for my summer blooming fowls however we've been and done that i did not do the addressing questions thing at that time because i was kind of waiting for more people to see the video and add any questions they might have and me answering you know in subsequent questions so I thought we would just uh, discuss a little bit the previous video and talk about some of the comments and questions in that video. So I'm going to go with some uh, confirmations of what I was trying to say in my other video, confirming that others feel the same way, not because I feel that justifies what I'm doing, but simply because I think it's interesting to hear other people's opinions and experiences with silicon in their orchid collection, whether it is grown inorganically or organically. So Orchid Delirium said that it, what interesting timing. I just gave a silicon bath to the orchids today and I do it every three months. Well there, that I think is super interesting and I actually asked back basically are you happy with the results? Do you feel it does make a difference in your collection? To which she responded, it feels like the plants are getting more, a little more rigid. I haven't had very many pest issues until the catacetony start leafing out. All the sweet sap in the air seems to have called the pest, so now it's a great time to see if they benefit from it. So, Orchid Delirium, that was a couple of weeks ago. How do you feel about it now? Do you see any improvements is there still some pests hanging around your catacetony i'd be interested maybe a video if you have time would be also of interest as an extension to this one that could be interesting so let me know the orchid room also had a good comment here i really like silicon too i really get very few spider mite issues from my plants unless they're a bit stressed yes that can happen and I really put it down to silicon when I do get an outbreak it's usually on a plant I've recently repotted or accidentally let dry etc and never on vandas fowls or catlias only on catacetums and on cidiums even my metoniopsis seem resistant never thought to fold your feed with it as you mentioned for the vandas now that I have the conservatory maybe I will supplement foliar feeding with magnesium sulfate at the least as I can air the room really easily. Do you think silicon is absorbed through leaves or just provide a coating action? I've never looked into this. Well, I think it depends on the time of day uh, and night, which will determine if it gets absorbed, bearing in mind that it's a minute amount, which to be effective in foliar feeding have to be repeated more than once a month. But as I'm able to go around and spray at liberty like Rambo, at least this time of year, the Vandas, Tolumnias and anything mounted get it pretty much every other day. I think it helps, my Tetratonia being the only one I never soaked, and boom, this year I had scale on her, which is now gone. Now she's getting soaked because the new growth will succumb to scale before they do uh, soak with the time to dry in between. So thank you Orchid Room for that comment. And um, yeah, foliar feeding is definitely something that I do, especially with my bare-rooted vandas. I do have the tub in which I soak my vandas, but very rarely do I put silicon in there because that tub isn't getting refreshed that often. It gets filled up, you know. So the there's no point in doing something that isn't going to be there long enough. So because I've, I can spray them and keep up the humidity every once in a while, I do have a weak solution of silicon in there because I don't want to cover the cuticles. And I can do it in the evenings, late afternoon evenings, where because it's warm enough now, I do not do that in the winter. So the next question came from Lynn Brooks. Morning, Nina. I say good morning because it's 1 a.m. Okay. <laughs> I use silicon occasionally. You don't know if it really, if I really need to, but I think it may be a bit fashionable at the moment. I don't have a time schedule for it. Only when I remember. So you use PPM, not mils per liter. The level seems quite low. Right. I did refer to the PPM because the concentration with the PPM is easy to follow. 
as opposed to some people have a different manufacturer of the product. And I feel that the PPM gives an idea of what I do. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily right. And the fact that I only do this for the six months of the year, um, I actually double what my manufacturer tells me to. So if you look it up on the internet, what people recommend for PPM is about 32 to 64 PPM. And I go at 100 once a month. And that's only for six months of the year. So I consider that pretty much st sticking with the guidelines and the recommended dosage. But um, yeah, not everybody works with milliliters. Um, so PPM was for me the better reference. My product at the moment calls for five milliliters and 10 liters. I double it. That depends on a product on an individual basis, but PPM is pretty much generally understood. So I went with that. So thank you, Perbin, for your comment. I appreciate your encouraging feedback with regards to my video. Thank you very much. And uh, the information was good about silicon. I appreciate that as well, because there's certainly more in-depth information out there. And I just try to keep it as simple as possible. So appreciate that. So you've never tried silicon uh, and your collection is going well. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Use distilled water with MSU fertilizer and CalMag and you've never had a problem with pests. Well, that is awesome. That is absolutely, yeah, I would say well done you. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, I, this collection is only two years old. Some are actually, some are three years old now, but I have other plants planted around my orchids that attract a lot of pests. And I think by doing that, I'm giving them a place to be and not come and accumulate themselves on my orchids. However, I have also noticed with my Tetratonia, and that was the kind of the click moment in my head of all of them that you see here, you've seen prior, they've all been handled with silicon, but my Tetratonium not. And yeah, the only one with scale this year. I don't know, for me, I think that doing inorganic there has to be extra supplementation because there are certain chemistries that are not occurring what would occur in an organic growing method. My opinion, but you know, if you've never had pests, my goodness, maybe you need to come up with why you haven't had pests and share it. I'm sure people would appreciate that. Honeybees and orchids, appreciate your comments very much. It was an informative video for you. Thank you. I appreciate that too. And the bottle says silicato di potassio. Does that mean it is potassium based? And if so, is it a potassium boost or a silicon boost? Well, good point, because I just look at the bottle and I see silicon. I just see the potassium element as the transportation mechanism to get the silicon into the plants. So you brought up a good point and thank you very much. Because for me, in my head, it was just silicon, but it, it's not. You're right. It's a bit of both boost. Thank you for that. Uh, brain jog which was very valuable thank you mona chica thank you for your kind little description of <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> the silicon treatment is it good for all plants yes it is actually and if you have terrestrials or whatever then you know any house plant absolutely it is not exclusive to orchids but the only thing with the orchids, uh, it, I would always be cautious with regards to the pH. Whereas if you do something with a house plant, the soil has a certain acidity, so you can just put it in there on some brands and, and it won't be a problem. Now, my bottle specifically says to check the pH before even watering, which makes sense because if you remember the other video, you could see how high the pH went and you had to go down quite a bit. So that's the only difference, but yes, absolutely perfect for any plants. Cherry colors. I think if you were watching this video, maybe some of your questions have already been answered. Thank you so much for your very kind comment. I really appreciate it. And it's so nice to hear that you're getting something out of the videos, please, uh, and everybody who watches this, I'm not insisting or implying that you can't grow orchids well without what I do. And maybe I'm wasting time, maybe I'm wasting money, but 
you know, um, I have this channel now and I just think that every angle, in my opinion, needs to be addressed. And if it works for you and if you if it inspires you, that's so great. And believe you me, when I read that, it it feels good. It really, really does. So thank you very much, Cherry. Basically, as you can see, I always soak, except for my bare root orchids. My general answer to your questions was anything bare root. I go with a lesser dose simply because I do it more often and I don't want anything to dry too quickly and leave some kind of a residue on it. I do want the leaves to absorb it. Bear in mind that foliar feeding in the summer is the best simply because you've got plenty of time for things to dry out. I, would, I don't do it in the winter. Uh, it's too risky for me. And these thick, thick cuticled orchids like the Cattleyas and, and the Vandas, they, they only open their stomata at night. So what does that mean? That means you have to go out early evening, like almost dusk, almost to semi-dark and full your feed your orchids. And that depending on your climate, I wouldn't do that in the winter. Now I cannot in mine, mine get too cold. So that's why they're getting double the amount throughout the summer for six months. And then really cool because I was doing my homework regarding this video, Cherry, and then I came across your next comment. You've ordered it. So great, awesome. You ordered it and you're planning to spray the orchids that are not in semi-hydro. What is weaker mixture and how often should I spray them with it? Can I spray the whole plant? My vandas are hanged with no media and my other orchids are potted. Thank you. So yes, absolutely. If you read my reply there, um, I, I would do it at 64 ppm if it's the bare root orchid then because you're going to do it more often they need it they need to be sprayed daily anyway so you might as well add some silicon in there at 64 ppm and just spray the whole plant absolutely no problem and remember what i said earlier with the thicker leaves and spraying at night oncidiums and all those thinner leaved orchids like also catacetony with thin leaves that's no problem you can fold your feet them during the day but i would always recommend the soak you're not wasting uh, the water as much. They absorb it much more quicker through the pots. So anything you have in your pots, just keep it with the soak. And I would also go at 64 or 100 ppm. Check your manufacturer label, get back to me on this video if you have any more doubts or questions, and then we can sort of tweak it based on what you have, okay? FFF, thank you, Fernanda. If anybody asks what FFF stands for, it's fabulous friend Fernanda that's what I've deemed her FFF so thank you for your comment very interesting subject and it would be nice to watch a second time around hello here we are I know this is a little bit more static less activity to get more familiar with it I heard someone mention it before but I got under the impression that it was mostly meant to increase hydration in warmer climates so no no I won't even read the next part and you're very welcome I'm glad that you are intrigued by the topic to have left this comment. The hydration factor is actually uh, true, but that is not because the, the orchid absorbs more water at a better rate. It's because the cuticle becomes thicker and inadvertently dehydration is lessened. It's actually the reverse is true. So dehydration is lessened due to the thickened cuticle and that is a consequence of the silicon, meaning the orchid stays hydrated for longer. Make sense? <laughs> Thank you so much if you've made it this far. There's just a few more little bits that I want to address. Uh, one of which is plants and things. Had a great comment. We'll get to that. So Trisha L, very interesting information. Thank you, Nina. You're very, very welcome. And says, I haven't been able to source liquid silicon in Australia. So we had a little bit of a dialogue there. But the best part is that while I was fast asleep, Lynn Brooks in the same hemisphere jumped in and said you will find on the shelf of the hydroponic outlets. I love that. Thank you so very much. If you see that there is no response and you have an answer, then my goodness, it's a, it's a place to answer the question if you can. There is nothing to stopping you except possibly you might think, oh no, she's not going to like it, meaning me. Absolutely not. I think it's awesome when I see people jump in and say, hey, this, that, and the other, and so, and so, and so. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lynn. I appreciate that. And 
Finally, plants and other things. Joshi asked, never tried silicon. Rather, my watering is super simple. No pH meter involved. So I would like someone to do the difference between added and not added. And guess what? I had a little think, which happens occasionally. Here are my new prostechias from Pretens. And I thought, why not? These are perfect candidates. They have just arrived, just been repotted. And what I'm going to do is take the Ionocentra and make that our candidate for silicon soaking. And the Brassavole will be no silicon soaking. It has a new growth coming. So does the other one. They're pretty much at similar stages of their current cycle. Let me just fill up the pot, get that soaking. It has a new growth coming right here. And this one, the Brassavole here, has a new growth down there. Although it is not moving just yet, and I doubt it will, because at this point, I think maybe this sheath might produce something. I don't know if that's what it's waiting for. It has that other little growth down there, which I'm not sure is going to amount to anything either. But for the sake of a test, these two, I think, are perfect. And we'll watch the Uranocentra. It will get the soakings throughout the summer. The Brassavole will not. And if you're still around next year, <laughs> We'll see if there's any difference, okay? One thing here is the foliage doesn't resemble exactly the same characteristics as the Brassavola, but I think that for purposes of an example, you have the same genus in a similar phase of growth, and I, and I think that this would give us some kind of an idea. So that's that thought process in, taken into consideration. So we have come full circle, we've been once around the table and um, I hope this video wasn't too boring or too tedious. It's a bit, uh, you know, somewhat difficult to go through comments and still be kind of entertaining and attractive a video. I don't know. I hope it worked out and I hope that everybody kind of understood the ins and outs and if this triggers more questions, bring it on. That's all I can say. Isn't she pretty? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We are coming on to our own. I do not have an ID for this one. It was sold to me as Epidendrum Nocturnum, and clearly it's not, so I have no idea who she is, but I consider her my little pixie fairy transportation vehicles. Thank you, everybody, very, very much for watching. I really appreciate it, as always, and, well, I'm here for you. I hope this was somewhat interesting. Not everybody gets back to the videos and looks at the other questions and maybe the accumulation of all those answers and questions, etc., is valuable just to have it in one video as, as opposed to having to go back read the comments. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you for watching. Bye.